Hello everyone, today we talk about the flags and uniforms of the Imperial Army, Holy Roman Empire, between the 16th and the 17th century, roughly something or so from the, the end of the 15th and say up to the second half of the 17th uh, excluded, right? So essentially up to the Thirty Years' War and uh, starting from Maximilian time. Uh, it's actually a broad topic, so I will try to uh, make it simple, as I usually do whenever I address this kind of, you know, dress, flags, aspects of, of the early modern armies for, for each people. Um, so, when we look at the empire, as you know, and here we're talking specifically about Germany, because of course it encompassed other territories, so mostly Central Europe, of course, of course we will look at Bohemia through Wallenstein, but in general, uh, of course, you know that there were other uh, imperial possessions uh, in Italy, for example, that were, however, ruled by the Spanish, still within, however, the Holy Roman Empire, so that's a bit different, and most of that pertains mostly to the Spanish tertio, or the tertios of um, Italy, of Sardinia, etc. There were naturally also Italian subjects serving in the, probably in, in the Habsburgic uh, in the Austrian Habsburgic army, right? So today we do not descend in this kind of depths. We just observe like basic German, sort of Central European, even because there are notoriously, in fact, as you as you know from the Idux, the Croats, etc., different ethnicities that came as far as the Ottoman Empire to fight into the German armies as well, right? And if we were to just talk about the variety of the uh, national background of the various mercenaries serving in these armies would have really to go too far length. I made, as you know, multiple videos about uh, mercenary warfare and specifically one about the, say, moral values and ethnic background of the early modern ones. So that can be useful as an intro. So, as we've seen also in the recent series about the Habsburgs, right, and the Alplanda and the other um, the other uh, realms, right, uh, mostly Bohemia, Hungary, um, the uh, Austrian Habsburgs, the empire, had really a very difficult time, right, trying to essentially uniform and homogenize, and even just levying enough resources from all these various estates that were naturally in pre-centralization times, or in or at least, say, you can talk about concentration of power, you can talk, of course, of sort of modern state, as modernists speak of, that is something ever more, of course, functional towards that direction, that the Habsburgs really work a lot to make work, but exactly because um, in, uh, in, in these times and places, it was really uh, very uh, far to become. Uh, such a thing, it's not until the 18th century that fundamentally the Habsburgs reached that this sort of say, fully modern, um, absolutely uh, enlightened way of uh, administering. This is valid also for Prussia, telling the truth, so it, it pertains a bit to this German uh, reality, right? And the main problem, of course, in that uh, capacity of fielding armies um, was brokering this say, the, the provision of such resources from the estates of the empire to the to the empire itself, to the, the imperial power authority. Uh, the estates and towns fundamentally provided the clothing, the equipment, the arms, the pay, and the supplies for these troops. And very often they had also to pay for their uh, billeting, because there weren't yet uh, essentially permanent barracks at the time, so gradually what would occur is that uh, the uh, the expenses of the estates were fairly limited because they had an, an important negotiable power with the center would increase um, so in terms of properly of money rather than and also well in part of the records of course but in order to provide the center with the uh, facilities to station train um, uh, supply maintain his troops that wouldn't, in fact, um, at that point, spend time within their own uh, their own territory at times. In other words, just you know, having uh, to be 
paid by an individual organization, ideally having to provide that same amount of resources materially, not just monetarily, right? So this is the context that in a country like with sort of 300 states within, you can understand being an extremely complicated uh, thing uh, to, to manage. All right. Yet there was some sort of standardization already that existed in any army to some degree well before well uh, mod the modern era, but from the dawn of warfare, I would say, that um, would come to identify also the empire. Right. So technically the strongest power within Germany and the, the official, uh, the public one. Right. We have, um, during the Thirty Years' War, cults of regimental color. We have seen this already happening, for example, in the Swedish army, uh, especially uh, for, for the mercenaries, um, the, the colored regiments of Gustavus Adolphus. I will re-upload that video with um, updated pictures, but uh, the concept being fundamentally the same. It was not really even, um, say, a primacy of, of, of some sort. There were different experiments. We do not even know exactly how all this supplying process concretely worked uh, so we have to rely even just on I don't know painting sometimes to, to understand what these uh, units would look like and, and a regimental color would correspond roughly to the, to the same flag ones and we've seen the tactical needs for this essentially armies were becoming ever uh, bigger professional uh, and they um, required thus also some sort of um, especially towards the end of this period of, say, uh, not just command skills, but, um, in fact, recognition means because they were employed in ever more dynamic ways, right, uh, from the mid-17th century. As you know, warfare would start fluidifying compared to the, um, sort of the, the bog that had transformed into in the first half of the 17th century, but not of, of say, uh, backwardness, uh, if not with later times, but because the forces involved in pike and shot warfare simply had slowed things dramatically up. Now instead, during the Thirty Years' War, there is a greater reliance on firepower, so movement, because that in the entailed the, the decrease of the pike, uh, that was naturally slow to maintain formation. And so you have to recognize in this huge mess quickly which troops, even just fairly large ones uh, are uh, from one another. Uh, hence the flag colors as well. For example, in Wallenstein's army uh, we find something like this. Uh, Berchtold um, von Wallenstein's regiment had green flags, for example. Uh, Max von Wallenstein, yellow ones. Um, and uh, Wallenstein's sphere of activity, as you know, included both military and the economic one. He thus had this massive sort of um, administrative capacity and supplying support right from his extensive states in Bohemia that su supplied in fact the troops with regular deliveries of beer, bread, clothes, ammo and all what was necessary in this regard and we know that the same uh, Wallenstein had uh, of course, I was very sensitive, accordingly to the uh, to the uh, to the necessity of uniformation, right? Uh, again, in the early 17th century, there, there were some uniform units uh, dress, uni uh, but the, the, this were weren't really, you know, uh, standardized for for the army, right? And sometimes even not even for single units. That anyway, after a few months of campaign, wouldn't physically have any uniform anymore, but this is true up to uh, very recent times. Uh, in the twenties of the 17th century, Wallenstein had even proposed um, properly a mass production of clothing and equipment uh, to an unprecedented scale, right, uh, that he had, he would have had even the, the technical means to provide um, as he had devoted uh, his own, uh, say, the, the facilities in his own Duchy of Friedland. Um, but, uh, say, even uniforming an army does cost significantly, even if it were just in dress, right? Um, so this 
Prowse's, um, this idea of his was never widely implemented. It would be long. It was sort of, uh, uh, f f say, foreshadowing what would have occurred um, a bit later in time. So surely uh, this, this, this army organization was mature, like the various states, etc., would eventually start, as we'll see now, because that's also during the 7th, uh, the Thirty Years' War, that the what would become the the 18th century uh, Austrian uh, uniform color, the pearl gray stamp uh, from, as this banally was coming to be the most uh, common type of color among uh, the imperial troops, just by out of sheer, you know, uh, lack of of actual dye, right? Because that was the point. If you look at other armies in history. Um, there was a you know a substantial expense that explains the reason why uniformation was not really possible, even um, other than say at some regimental level. In early modern German, the opposition to these measures was partly due um, to the complaints of the Inabath, that is to say, um, the say, a type of estate representative at this time in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, noblemen who held hereditary rights to an office or position such as a, a judge, administrator, tax collector, so uh, within a particular territory or province, so um, those who had to practically levy the um, the resources, at least the money, right? Um, and in in this context, they um, they would have as you know the, the as as part of the nobility, right, which was one of the four traditional estates, uh, quite important voice in uh, the imperial political affairs. The other three estates were, of course, the clergy, burghers, and the peasantry that were also to contribute uh, in this regard. So these were sort of proto-public offices that were subcontracted to the nobility, uh, as you understand. Uh, but all of them, all of these estates were represented uh, in the imperial diet. So the legislative body of the Holy Roman Empire that had to ideally provide with enough uh, resources for an imperial war, which is naturally a bit complicated. You realize that half of Germany sided with, you know, uh, against the emperor in that regard, and literally in arms. But in any case, the Inaba played an important role in uh, financing, uh, financing and su supplying troops for their respective territories. Um, they were also responsible for recruiting soldiers and enforcing taxes to support the war effort. Uh, and the problem um, is also that they would levy the regiments often, they could be subcontracted this as well, by not always commanding them, actually this was not even uh, the norm, right? Uh, Wallenstein at some point was also sort of soldier, right side and just an administrator. Uh, there were cases in which uh, those who uh, recruited the regiments would also actually command them. Uh, and that's also part of the reason why the, this were some of the best businessmen uh, in, um, in the realm of war. Um, but um, the opposition stemmed also from the fact that the Naba preferred their regiments to be distinctive in their dress, not least because money could be siphoned off from central funding allocated for paying local manufacturers, which wouldn't actually help the actual process of standardization, at least by some degree, but it would, would cost more than um, the actual result, right? So, the, the and there was a lot of corruption uh, in it. So, even when the, the imperial central authorities took over the supply business, from the military entrepreneurs, because there were others that also didn't even want to pay for that. I mean, um, uh, you know, especially the ones that were more specifically into this um, supplying provision. Uh, the, uh, the 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 business from the military entrepreneurs they often lacked funds, and as such, um, the Naba were retained um, uh, discretional criterion whether to supply uh, uniforms. We're talking uniforms, by the way, we're talking essentially about certain uh, clothes that were told at some point even to be dyed in a, of a particular color um, and 
having to leave even the troops to uh, to do that some, at some time. So it was everything uh, really archaic to, to some degree. But paradoxically, these were the beginnings still of that increased level of uniformity. Uh, Wallenstein's pages uh, wore scarlet and light uh, blue as a livery. Uh, these colors appeared also on his Lancer bodyguard um, and on his foot lifeguard of 600 who had gold lace clothing, silver, silver lace bandoliers and silver pike points and naturally this is just um, Wallenstein's sort of uh, idealistic you know, aesthetics that as you know was very traditional in some ways and had to embody his own personal power um, which is also part of the reason, or most of the reason, why it was actually taken out. Um, and yet, right, it, this this shows how it was, you know, in every country we've seen it also in, in entire kingdoms, always an effort to have, especially for the, for the bodyguards, for royal troops, to provide for a minimum of uniformity, um, except for the fact that even these armies were uh, constituted still in a sort of... Um, traditional way with different um, sort of regiments that came also from very different, uh, could come at least from very different traditions, even from different countries. We've seen it particularly uh, for the kingdom uh, of Poland, right? So in all this mess, the most, um, say, obvious result is that uh, when you look at imperial soldiers throughout, and here not just talking about the 16th century when everything was a bit old, more um, even looser, I'd say, um, they would turn out in, in a mixture of civilian military styles, right? Following mostly civilian fashions. I made a video about the Landsknecht uh, dress, which illustrates a bit more in depth that specific type of fashion. So this video is to be integrated with that one. Uh, we will talk briefly about the Langsnecks, but mostly from as far as the f their flags uh, were concerned, because also they, uh, as uh, mercenaries, they would fight there as uh, literally imperial troops, right? So they, they were to be identified accordingly. And how, of course, their fashion came to be even within Germany is something I explained also in that video about the Langsknecht and, um, in general as a sort of new estate of military um, uh, public servants, fundamentally. Um, there was some similarity, of course, in the more practical side of clothing on campaign. And this applies, generally speaking, to all early modern armies. When you look at them um, in Western Europe, um, soldiers tended to wear the strong brown or black leather shoes that were, of course, necessary to withstand the, the long marches, etc. And very often, you know, these would also disintegrate um, uh, over time uh, during, say, the, normally during a campaign. Knee-lent socks, right? Uh, sometimes you, they would wear stout leggings over them that resemble the floppy top riding boots in, in a way. Then, uh, at some point, the uh, the, the fashion was a, the, the sort of baggy knee length breeches, this is especially during the 16th century, famously enough. A thick white shirt, usually supplied with a spare, and a jacket with uh, wide sleeves or a thick sort of buff leather jerkin that would increase protection uh, for what essentially. Here we're talking mostly infantry, right? Um, w was uh, was needing in the era of pike and shot when essentially armor was uh, declining, um, and uh, just the uh, the front ranks tended to to maintain them for for a longer time. In bad weather, which of course in Central Europe throughout the military season that uh, dragged on and often until you know late autumn. Uh, the troops would wrap themselves in a simple but yet effective hip-length cape, sometimes even longer cloaks, right? This depends largely on what they found when they pillaged, whether they managed to 
cover themselves, of course they would tend to fight with more sort of um, uh, agile vests, let's put it in this way. Uh, in winter, uh, during the cantonments, you could see them with warm fur caps, uh, short-haired fur coats or fur-lean cloaks made of uh, made of thick woolen cloth. Um, you, here you could see uh, different types of um, decorations. Let's say the breeches, other garments could really come in a, in an important variety of different colors, such as orange, white, gray, uh, black, green, brown, uh, blue red brown usually the say the the most colorful um were less frequent just statistically uh the breeches were also joined uh at the knee uh through a ribbon and they tended to match uh or at least to contrast the the colors uh of the breeches normally stocking were white gray or unbleached Right. Uh, even though many imperial troops also wore red, as far as the other one, naturally you can expect coats, um, breeches, and stockings uh, made of wool. Of course, it would isolate um, mostly in a colder uh, weather. Reason for which is that the uh, undergarments, uh, such as shirts, were usually of linen that also isolates but it's you know um, fresher of course uh, it was recommended that, that clothing should contain as little fur trim and as few seams as possible because guess why because of the lice of course that would uh, anidate uh, into it so just think even the just the precarious to say the least, uh, hygienic conditions during you know a war that wiped out one third of the entire German's German population, right? So, um, say lice was the the list that you had to worry about, um, but in general you could um, you could use uh, of course important precautions not to make it worse. Um, you would have seen as headgear. Uh, wide-brimmed felt hats. Uh, these also were usually brown or gray. This would be the say, typical colors if you look at, I don't know, the English Civil War or other contexts that normally, aside from, again, the, the few um, uh, units could be, uh, at the moment, well supplied with sort of uniform clothes. That's the uh, the color tends to stick out. Also because it is even mimetic. And we've seen how during the Thirty Years' War, in spite of, this is valid uh, even more for the English Civil War, in spite of important engagements fought um, in in open field with thousands, uh, tens of thousands of men, um, most of the operations were some sort of um, skirmishes, guerrillas, raids, etc. And so um, you had consistently some important need to uh, hide, to, uh, to be spotted, uh, that much, right? He said in open field, everything was as we were saying before about the commander having a quite Im immediate uh, visual recognition of, say, the troops' location uh, to unfold uh, their tactics. Um, there were helmeted troops, uh, as we've seen, they usually wore a knitted wool cap underneath uh, the helmet. Then, during these tremendous campaigns that you can find a glimpse of in Simplicius Simplicissimus by von Grimmelhausen, you could imagine these troops moving at, at times literally as beggars and or loaded with lots um, of stuff, maybe their, their clothes reduced to rags, but still carrying with them spare clothing, plunder, food, and any other kind of item, right? They would prefer for carrying uh, these some... Uh, snap sacks or also small bags uh, across the shoulder. Um, we do have, as we were saying at the beginning, really a few info about the, even the, say, sometimes even of the evidence, but in 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 the case of it, the degree of uniformation uh, in color during uh, this period, right? We know 
uh, that from, from, for example, a 1632 clothing order uh, issued by uh, a colonel uh, in, in, uh, in command of a company of, of the Art Deck Infantry Regiment, revealing that the regimental adjutant had ordered material for blue co coats lined in red, right? So something also slightly more articulate for the various um, companies, pre presumably. Um, so in this um, case, we would have had blue um, and red as a predominant combination. And this is evidenced also by uh, the Inaba's coat of arms. The same guy who had issued this essentially would place his own colors on the company, right? So in, in some ways it was that, say, uniform, maybe at a company level, but still based, as we will see better now, on different certain uh, groups of very different people, right? And here we're talking mostly about the 17th century, but in the 16th it was even more varied. Medieval in many ways, you know, that every company showed up with, with, with their own colors, they... There could be mercenaries, noblemen, militias, uh, all with their own ensigns, with their own sub. Um, I made a video just recently about all the various types of flags, banners, etc. Um, in 15th century, yeah, 14th, 15th century Western European army, so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about more concretely. And you, you understand, of course, just after a few centuries later how this, this was gradually going to something more uniform, but fundamentally responded still to the same content. Um, during 1635, we know that the clothing color of the aforementioned company changed again to become predominantly red, right? Um, and you can imagine, again, the Naba changing these also relatively frequently for the aforementioned reason that, again, mostly after uh, a campaign, the, these clothes would not exist anymore. In any case, our best source, our best evidence for uh, clothing in uniform um, are painters, namely Sebastian Franz, um, Peter Snyers. Uh, these were sometimes not talking necessarily about Germans either, um, but they were quite realistic, right, uh, especially from, from a conceptual point of view, to, to represent uh, the soldiery, right, the, the Thirty Years' War. You know, artistically there was a sort of quasi-grotesque uh, approach to these themes, especially as far as the the plebs, like the, the, the lower soldiery really was. It was not representing, well, it could represent still great leaders, but at that point the great leader that likely had commissioned this, um, it was being celebrated, would, didn't want to be, to appear next to um, the soldiers, at least in the type of, you know, um, appearance that they had more concretely. Instead, these authors, these artists are precious because they show you, uh, you know, the, also the, the crudest aspects of looting, raiding, massacring, etc. And they show pretty accurate um, address, uh, circumstances, um, the widespread adoption of natural color, for example, right? That is not just about the painter depicting some generic soldiers, right? But literally, of course, we're talking about early 17th century Europe. I mean, aside from this degree of uniformation, some unit, there would be essentially an identical uh, appearance. Uh, the unbleached whitish gray cloth, for example, uh, was quite famous, and this is, as we were premising before, uh, to become, during the second half of the 17th century, the more famous sort of pearl gray um, uh, uniform color of the future Habsburgic say, army, at, at least in the way it's more famous, uh, Lee, uh, you know, out there during the the 18th, the 19th century until, say, also more mimetic colors kicked in um, and the empire crumbled in the 20th. But just for, for saying how um, such colors at times would stem from 
relatively banal reasons, where also the French had a similar color, um, but in general they, they would also differentiate it, because it, it's not just about that, there is a, a psychological value to colors, uh, not just in the merit of, say, knowing what kind of unit you belong, and so knowing the history of it, etc., but literally an, an effect that the chromatic a dimension gives to the soldier itself, and so you can see this as a sort of reminiscence of traditional uh, uh, values connected to those to colors to the heraldic symbology. And we'll talk about this too uh, at some point. Needless to say, officers differed uh, significantly from their men, uh, at least in in a in an ideal uh, situation, uh, f and mostly uh, for, because of the superior quality of their clothing, right? Uh, these are, especially say, in German, if you think about the Langsnecht, then, uh, but also, that also lost, however, that kind of style by uh, by the 17th century, they also declined, but in general, the, the first half of the 17th century is a very, you know, picturesque, to say the least, time in fashion, also in civilian one, that as we've seen, was was also pretty much there because soldiers didn't look very different from from civilians, at least in clothing. Uh, and this would cause officers, naturally, for for a long time to come, to have a significantly uh, more uh, varying uh, appearance uh, than the soldiers, and having relatively few to do also with the concept of, of uniformity for the same units uh, that they commanded. Uh, naturally, not all officers um, were also of the same status, so this would affect the uh, the say the type of wealth they could boast um, in clothing. And clothing was very important in that sense to just. Uh, self-promote also your own image. You have seen it in the in al Faraki, for example, in many. There, there is really a lot of literature on this of how uh, this was still a world of misery, even for the officers, even for especially for those noblemen that uh, were impoverished enough to dedicate themselves to the craft of arms, but that even at very high levels of European nobility, in fact, were often um, the void of money, and uh, the only way to just to to make uh, the same was to show off on the field and to even have this incredibly uh, sort of still individualistic, warrioristic sort of uh, chivalric mindset. As far, especially as the sense of honor, the reputation uh, between uh, uh, not just as far as the enemy was concerned, but the same officers, right, in the same army, and the competition that existed. There, who was the first to achieve what? What were their capacities? Would, would, would in that sense, uh, make the best uh, impression? In a broader sense, we know of such expensive materials as silk, lace, velvet, uh, even metallic thread embroidery, fur, leather, uh, and so also other material that was not necessarily particularly expensive, but and so everything was very. Uh, customized, personalized. The rank status was not really showed in a standardized way, but generally speaking, a colored sash worn from the left shoulder to, to the right hip or wrapped around the waist had that sense of, say, this, this guy's a nobleman, this guy's this is an officer, an important point of reference for, uh, for the troops, you know, that the guy is taken out uh, well, it's like uh, as if you 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 destroy the uh, the commander in a tank. You, you you're going to have just the entire system uh, collapsing significantly, uh, and um, so th this helped in a way. It was also just a way of uh, showing off. It was a sort of saying, okay, well, considered at this point with a smooth bore, um, you didn't you you did have sharpshooters actually, but. You know, it was much easier to go out there and say, well, you know, sh I shoot at me because um, I, I stand out even, right? It was a way to embolden uh, the troops from your side 
and to also to scare in that sense the the enemy showing how few you actually um, feared them and how you were just coming there uh, to get them and consider that pike and shot warfare was very much about this right a, a relentless um, say advance under repeated uh, volleys of fire because uh, throughout our entire period uh, the shot was not enough to wear out the pike uh, significantly before this could reach the you know your own line so um, uh, the, the entire point was maintaining cohesion during the advance under this this enemy fire and so whatever you you show that this is say this is how it worked at the time in many ways there are equivalents throughout the entire concept of, of attack in military history but it was again this period that meant tradition and modernity um, uh, at the same time and so having this sort of chivalry uh, behaviors right of fanatic bravery as they would always remain in warfare but still with a sense of status, right? That was quite, uh, again, violently, ferociously aristocratic um, in nature. The um, period was dominated, especially the 30s um, of the 17th century, by German and Swedish fashion in military clothing, right? Initially, the Spanish had had the greatest influence, you know that the same Landsknecht then in the um, 16th century were adopting that sort of flamboyant uh, style, de, fa de facto from a Spanish one, uh, but um, of course during the Thirty Years War Spanish military power gradually declined and given that just uh, the war was mainly fought in Central Europe, uh, you had a essentially a German, uh, a huge German battlefield, right, and that was eventually invested by the Swedes that were bringing their own uh, styles, but we are also, again, looking at fairly similar ones. For example, among the officers, we can notice the passage from the, the tight-sleeved jackets to the looser doublets, right, that were often made of silk or uh, rather costly materials with long front skirts, and they were um, finished, by the way, completed by white lace colors, very typical of the period, um, that is somehow different, in fact, what had been the previously and rather stiff Spanish ruff. You have baggy trousers replaced in the mid-17th century by... Uh, tighter knee-length breeches, right? You have riding boots replacing Spanish shoes, um, etc. This, this were sometimes, like, there were actually always practical um, sort of changes, right? But they, they became also more generalized as a fashion, right? The only uh, military men that could wear literally whatever they wanted, uh, or almost, and naturally also there within the limit of sanity and functionality, were the general officers, right? These were really sometimes also better better armored um, in general, like they could wear gorgets, uh, breast and back plates. Uh, they risked uh, life, actually. They were cuirassiers, um, of course, uh, at, throughout the entire period, so uh, armor they don't really die out, uh, of course, throughout this period, but it was being ever more confined toward the 17th century to, um, to the officers uh, and to the, the heavy cavalry that, however, was also to, at some point, uh, say, largely abandoned that, um, except for very picked units of really ultra-shock um, uh, specialty you would have other decorative pieces of armor, and all of the finest quality, of course, uh, looking at these top guys, let's say. Um, with the end of the Thirty Years' War, 
um, you would start seeing what Wallenstein had envisaged as far as the, the mass production of uh, uniforms uh, in April 1645 Graf von Gallas that was the president of the Hofkriegsrat so the, uh, the, the, the Council of War for the Mid of the Empire sent an order for 600 uniforms for his regiment um, that was issued with a shade of pale gray uh, as far as the dress color was concerned. Some accompanying pieces of this um, order material are still to be seen at the Heeres Geschichtliches Museum of uh, Vienna while, and that's the other beautiful piece, um, some mass production local manufacturing of powder horns and cartridge um, is to be found at the Landes uh, Zeughaus of Graz in Austria. Uh, this shows like the, the the level achieved exactly in those years in terms of mass production of arms and armor. Right, you have this. You know, if you visit, it, it's literally all filled with old series of of armor, literally stocked right in there, because uh, it's not like just um, mere, say, individual pieces that you can't observe, but it's literally the entire... Uh, the, there is really actually lots of this um, museums, um, this armories, uh, a bit all across um, Central Europe, and some like these are um, really, really famous, because you find next to the standardization also all those elements of a um, experimentation that even still with crossbows with stuff of course uh, there are hand uh, say grenade launchers all the stuff stuff that would have in part died out and already had telling the truth from the battlefields others that were to develop actually into something more um, really more uh, u uh, u usual and standardized in later times but that you know were, were there with levels of sometimes even handcrafted um, uniqueness, right? Consider that when we talk about especially the Austrian Augsburgs uh, compared to the Spanish branch, we have to think that they didn't really have all the financial resources available uh, to, to, the, to the Spanish from uh, the Aztecs and Incas loot, right? For example, uh, the Austrian Habsburgs could not imitate uh, the Emperor the Charles V New Burgundian style Lancers. That in this sense also belonged a bit to a more say distant world, even within the Empire, uh, than their own. Um, so they were somehow forced to adopt a cheaper path. And even the so called black Reiter that were um this new type, at least the the Reiter in general, but um, for this um, color of armor and somber dress, right, that st still somehow distinguished the the Habsburgic um, house of Austria, so that it was trying there with less money, also no saints in in their court in their dynasty, um, really to to win by um, moral um, uh, rigidity, right, their own their own imperial superiority, right, were um, introduced, right, the sense that, of course, these uh, there were lancers used uh, together with the pistoliers, essentially, as these are, as uh, the, the norm in uh, mounted warfare during this period, right, but the heavier lancers were really costly, and even the, the Austrian Habsburgs, uh, really had difficulties to, to fill them in consistent numbers, so the the, the pistoliers, the skirmishers, the lighter type of cavalry there. Um, also thanks to the uh, updated clockwork technology of Germany, right, that uh, made it available for especially the wheel lock pistol uh, mechanism, and so the type of reloading that would favor the tactics as well. 
uh, would be would become more typical and also as you know with this style of warfare fighting or well, being hired abroad etc the peak of this was the mid 16th century after which cavalry could when, when cavalry had also as you know re we explained it many times reached a uh, minimum tactically compared to infantry whereas um, later on in the second half of the 16th century it con uh, it began to rise once again right until the 18th so um, you have their um, say other types of cavalry also of ethnic origin that are that were particularly appreciated and that would leave a mark uh, folkloristically uh, uh, but in the military uh, of our Western world uh, and that really are a bit the relic of step warfare that had remained traditional in some parts of Europe or and or that had re kicked in because of different reasons we're talking about troops such as the Serbian Hajduks, the Croats, the, the Poles, we're not talking cavalry only but importantly so and I made especially um, a series, a complete series about the Polish-Lithuanian uh, army during this period so there is all a, a playlist uh, treating this and, and we'll come back on it by the way in different other videos uh, as well still have to talk about the Serbians at this time but the Croats are definitely the most famous within this context. Now what is fascinating as I was just saying is that these countries had been historically just you know senators um, from quite a while but aside from the uh, mercenary nomadism that we can observe in fact as some of these um, peoples lived within at some point within the Habsburgic um, domains but others came also from abroad um, and especially those areas that were at the frontier between in fact the uh, the the Christian world and at least the, the Western one and the Ottoman Empire meaning of course that some of these guys were Christians fighting for the Ottomans as well um, but others would serve abroad and of course say in the 16th and 17th century couldn't quite just uh, control everyone and um, even uh, as subjects and there were different ways these peoples would interact with, with these various uh, polities. Now the important aspect of this is that a white centuries again the frontier areas had turned these peoples in, into some sort again of more militarized sort of to raiding warfare kind of uh, activity more than had been the case as you know the idox were um, supplied as uh, Serbian resistance against the Ottomans by the Venetians and the Habsburgs um, you have the, the Croats that were eventually more within probably the Habsburgic world um, and, and the Poles too had experienced um, this great uh, widening of their uh, empire in the, to, towards the east and so towards the steppes uh, that had brought to a sort of re uh, Easternization of their warfare that otherwise at the beginning of this period was fully westernized so you have a lot of uh, say exotic stuff that looks very much like the steppes and that looks very much also like uh, all these various populations that the Ottomans could mobilize uh, in the Balkans uh, in the Black Sea etc from the steppes uh, and beyond now we'll stick to the um, Croatian uh, equipment which um, is definitely the, the most um, iconic right the the Croats were a specific type of trooper right uh, more dedicated to guerrilla to skirmishers to raids uh, and they were pretty good at that right uh, as far as their dress was concerned it's where say the Croats were also this is a bit typical of again it's not that the Croats were from the steps of course but they had learned in a way in the centuries to to imitate if you want all these horsemen that they they saw crossing their lands and, and fighting um uh, in in uh, coming from the step where for example showing off your own wealth is paramount in your equipment 
right? Also because you literally, in the step, just travel with that. And as mercenaries, here there is an analogy. Uh, the crafts were, were fond of gold lace, for example, jewelry, bright colors, as we will see now, especially red, right? Um, most balcony regulars in general wore striped waist sashes, right? These are typical, again, of, also of the eye duke, uh, and not only, right? They tended to avoid other, other colors, such as green or blue, because these were more um, common among the Ottomans. Right, so it's as if they had been Turks for for their standards, and this is this was not very much uh, their intention. Definitely, they had black boots also for the same reason. Um, the uh, traditional costume completely uh, consisted in a short, tight tunic again, and and sometimes also a sleeveless one, with or without a long, full-lined coat. Uh, both, however, being secured by buttons and cord loops. The tunic could extend uh, a, a bit over the top of the trousers, um, so they were not overly uh, clothed, also because they were quite hot-tempered, and, you know, just being active on, on horseback and just in combat makes you really um, want to, uh, again, wear something more agile, even lighter in the first place, even at the expense of your uh, protection, which is tendentially not the major reason, right? But it can happen, right? Uh, even the Central European sun in summer can be really a, a terrifying experience. So red, as we've seen, was the preferred color. The Ottoman green or blue was occasionally also worn, in spite of this sort of saying and general tendency, uh, for which it would avoid being identified um, with, the, with, with the Turk. The trousers were looser, cut above the knee, while tied below. Um, it, it was often tied below the knee as well. As far as the head gear was concerned, it was rather simple. Uh, this extended bag style hat, usually in red, uh, as well. Uh, as well. Um, even though, again, they prefer this lighter equipment, they, uh, of course, covered themselves in cold or wet weather uh, with this traditional um, long red cloak that, in fact, would become famous later on because this is one of the loans from the Croats, the infantry hot mantle. This consisted uh, in, again, the mantle plus a hood that was sometimes uh, buttoned together in two parts, although uh, some Croats continued to wear some more traditional ship skins, right, uh, from their, you understand also the, the background of usually Shepherds, we've seen them to be more warlike. Just the other day we were talking about the Vlachs, and I made a video about Vlach infantry, by the way. Um, the Croats wore the local, their own type of leather boot that was higher at the front than the back. Um, while the Harkabusiers had knee-length boots, uh, you could see them wearing also an neckerchief or scarf bowl, as well as a, a wa the, the aforementioned waist sash. Uh, the scarves were uh, made of silk in the case of officers, and um, this had, especially for cavalry, an important function of protecting from sweat and dust, uh, but also uh, it could serve as an effective uh, bandage to bind wounds because uh, especially silk is, as you know is, is very um, impermeable in, in many ways so in, in some parts of the world it was even used as a as armor as a matter of fact and perhaps the most famous Croat uh, contribution to not just military uh, but also just civilian clothing that appears in our uh, at least in many of our language, is the uh, historical necktie, right, that we wear with, with suits. 
uh, the English cravat, right? The French cravat, the Italian cravatta, the Spanish corbata, corbata, the Turkish Hungarian cravat, the, even the Finnish cravatti. Well, these all stem from, of course, the the Croatian, right? The the Croat type of uh, necktie that really stem from these uh, this background, also in a military context. Um, the Croatian officers wore also a knee-length fur lean coat and a fur hat, usually. Um, there are very intimidating also reenactment uh, pictures that show you what these guys were about, really. Um, there were definitely also other types of, of styles. For example, the Hungarian Hussars, and we'll talk about that because this was originally a Serbian thing that passed into the Hungarian army and the Polish one it was originally light, but then the Poles made it heavy. But as you know, in the 18th century, it's the, the lighter Hungarian type that remains prevalent. So they, they preferred a loose knee-length coat uh, known as Dolman, which is uh, a loan from Turkish the Dolman. Right. This was worn under uh, their mail. Um, uh, the this was true also for the Croatians, by the way. Those relatively few that had mail, at least, you know, these were contingents, as we will see now, that were raised and not very differently from the 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 ancient war bands were like. Most of the officers were aristocrats, and they lived still within a sort of feudal. Uh, societies in which they just put themselves at the disposal of, of whoever, right? You could find it even among the, the Polish uh, Slachta, they, they had their mini royal armies within their own oligarchic possessions. So, uh, of course, this is a, a substantially different world um, from the uh, w w also, say, Western Europe is becoming. Let's um, put German, most of Germany at this point within Western rather than Central Europe in this kind of military tradition. There were similar things also there, telling the truth, there were areas like Saxony and Brandenburg that were somehow more uh, more ancestral and primitive uh, in nature. But definitely um, Slavic Europe um, was, generally speaking, more, uh, even more, uh, say, backward, but say not uh, at least in the, in the way of warlikeness uh, that made of these mercenaries like uh, highly sought after troops that would in fact leave also this impact in, in the actual typologies uh, of cavalry and or mounted infantry at some point in the uh, later regularized national uh, armies right just as troops typologies um, the tight trousers of these troops reach, by the way, down to leather ankle boots, uh, or more often the Turkish half half boots. There was also the European square toe bucket boot, sometimes worn, um, but even more often the Turkish style pointed toe, which had irons within it that would force actually the foot into an unnaturally curved position by increasing the protection of the same foot and the uh, same uh, stability on the stirrup. Then um, the tops of the longer boots especially were cut, sort of rounded shape, that was reminiscent here of the old uh, leg armor. As we said, officers were mostly aristocrats, so they would also have regularly better quality clothing, together with armor and equipment. Uh, we mentioned the Croat uh, taste for gold and silver displayed in thread and inlays. Uh, you would see even jewelry uh, displayed on, on the battlefield uh, in, the, in armor, etc. This was, again, part of a past in which these things, even even the relics were brought in the hills of the swords and this kind of things. Um, the officers' coats were especially and increasingly decorated with gold and silver cords, even with additional buttons. Some of these items were fundamentally to even survive in part of our uh, sort of 
um, chevron right uh, at Sinelia you could find um, animal skin worn over the left shoulder another typically steppish thing you find it even among the, the Ottomans in this case it seems to have been a uh, an Hungarian contribution mainly this was yet another element in fact remaining in the future so-called hussar uniform right leopard skins this kind of uh, sort of beast warriors um, sort of primordial legacy the affluent officers wore as a rank of distinction a gilt or silver selenka that was essentially the solid hard version of the feathers that were worn by the other officers plus the uh, small um, mace could be carried as a sort of baton uh, and explain their uh, higher uh, command uh, authority this is very steppish um, as well Turkic Mongolian but not only we I made a video about bludgeoning weapons just recently this was a thing also in Europe but it survived mostly in this sort of steppish um, influence uh, reality were massive as you know war hammers things like these to literally you know make skulls exploding um, but this was really also a, probably a sort of more symbolic object a bit like later on uh, halberds for example would be kept uh, in use by say in dotation to, uh, to the NCOs and of course could serve as actual weapons in combat but were mostly just um, a vestige of a, of a past in which uh, this sort of still warrior uh, individualism was very much into the valor of, of the leaders as well. Um, speaking of the Hungarian light cavalry officers, these wore an upright white heron feather plume on the side of the helmet. Compared to the heavier Hungarian horsemen, the light cavalrymen would use um, a lighter form of saddle that was uh, historically magier, and more similar to, again, the one of the steppes, so the stirrups were usually higher. The Ottomans had similar ones, and it had come to, to modify, in fact, also the same Hungarian uh, tradition. Uh, this saddle had a, a light frame, covered with animal skin uh, and it uh, was placed on, on a richly decorated uh, cloth that um, had uh, at least often some squared or pointed corners. Uh, this would actually become uh, the shabrak uh, in the future right, uh, European warfare and Pistol holsters were there, as well secured by straps over the forward peak of the saddle tree. The lower ends were secured um, also to the to the breast band on two straps that uh, essentially connected the horse's head um, through a rivet hung uh, decoration which. Uh, would become the gilt crescent of the later hussars and uh, at this time it, it seemingly uh, was essentially constituted by a pair of wild boar's teeth a horse tail or fox brush right? um, evidencing also the again a sort of rustic background the the hunting uh, privilege the sort of again still I killed uh, you know the the prey and I get increased in power through that uh, an officer's harness would have leather straps fixed together with gilt or silver rivets without her uh, use instead purely for decoration that added to the psychological effect um, of these warriors um, so you have this Hydox Croats and Polish uh, troops you, having variation on their national customs, right? So if you were to 
see uh, as we've seen the, the main difference is uh, you would have for the high dogs I don't know a, a tight ankle length pantaloon while the crot trouser was rather um, were really baggy right in the upper part and tighter than knee um, all of these troops mostly wore just a simple shirt and, and jacket often sleeveless as we've seen together with uh, the ubiquitous cloak it's a very simple equipment similar again to, to the ultimate one uh, at least of the the areas were the, the troops that were used in, in the same regions of course they were mostly the same people um, the opankan shoes were used by the Croats, right? They were um, in the sim just the sim simple tongued and quite practical in this sense. The Iduks wore more Hungarian influenced ankle boots, in part because most of Hungary was at least the most military active was, was closer to Serbia. Uh, there were also riding boots um, used by the Iduks as well. And uh the general uh, appearance with long coats cloaks um with heavy woolen clothes or animal skins or furs were uh, were quite useful in bad weather uh, uh they were usually hooded and they again were simple but effective and these guys were simply able to create one of their own out there in the wild so Again, these troops were really um, very effective as far as this independence and, and independence and dynamics uh, were were concerned. When we look at um, flags, which is yeah, to the other topic here, we um, observe a an important variety that reflects, however, a more still standardly institutionalized. Um, reality than the uniform, right? Um, the flag is more representative. In 16th and 17th century Germany, the Fenrich was a military rank for a junior officer who was responsible for carrying the unit's colors uh, or flag into battle, right? The Fenrich would lead the unit and rally their troops behind the colors. They were typically one of the lowest ranking officers in the military hierarchy but they were among in fact uh, those that were closer to the troops the rank was eventually phased out in the early 18th century you can understand throughout history how the um, uh, the, the flag bearer was crucial for tactical issues for the morale for um, the also the qualities that he had to display in order to reach um, that uh, point and first hoping to rise in, in the hierarchy right if we were to look I don't know the typical dragoon right of, of the time uh, it would have bore an imperial yellow as well low tailed dragoon guido right for example uh, the one is beautifully preserved in the army museum of Stockholm right and as we will see now, there were different, many different, uh, still sort of similar mottos. For example, pro deo et patria, to God and country, or in the reverse, the standard bearers. Uh, in this case, we're talking about imperial troops, the usual imperial arms, and the motto pro Cesare, so for Caesar, that is the emperor. All right. Um, and like other officers, the ensign. Uh, would be wearing expensive clothing normally uh, with long ostrich plumes typically uh, broad lace collars if we were talking about essentially the, um, the 17th century as well um, and exposed over his gorget by the way and double with slashed or pain sleeves um, the imperial collars being as you know essentially gold or yellow uh, black and red um, red breeches and sash were also there so uh, these would represent they would also have a symbolism uh, on their own uh, the aforementioned croats too were given at that point uh, you know, imperial flags right usually large triangular ones with, with devices including um, 
Fortuna, which, as you have seen from the Fortuna Kaiser, is a uh, video where he had a, a deep connection with the imperial ideology and its traditional meaning of attainment, as we will see now also from other mottos, that blows your mind at that point, because you realize still by the 17th century it was just like they believed the same thing that had been believing for millennia, just we don't know it now because it's been removed from our ideas. Uh, the uh, Croats would receive an, even the imperial eagle at times, right? Um, in in the 16th century, um, especially looking at the last next, but in, also for the following uh, century for imperial troops in general, you could see uh, standards with uh, geometrical patterns, mostly checks, diamonds, etc. The colors were usually bright. Uh, the imperial eagle was pretty much um, out there, as you, as you can imagine. There were white, golden backgrounds. Um, there was even uh, the uh, one of white standard in 1620 with the crown right because of the victory uh of emperor ferdinand the second at the battle of the white mountain uh, that had st stripped frederick of bohemia in fact this crown was placed now on the imperial eagle's head right um and it's important to stress that this victory was ascribed to direct intervention of the virgin mary and therefore her image began to be applied to the reverse of the colors often in, in imperial armies, right? This was not um, unheard of also in other, uh, in other circumstances, but it's, of course, in a confessional war, uh, it would somehow define the struggle, and it would influence the Habsburgic banners so much that uh, the Blessed Virgin would remain uh, until 1915 um, as just a portrait, right, that regimental flags the Leibfahne had to normally um, uh, to normally bring with them, since, again, the, the Battle of the White Mountain, when Emperor Ferdinand had decided to call uh, the, vir uh, the Virgin's uh, divine assistance to, uh, to the Imperial forces, right, and the most typical image of the Madonna that would remain famous. We also think about the Maria Hill. We've seen it in the, for the 1683 siege of Vienna mythology, etc. Uh, it would be usually depicted standing on a crescent moon, right, surrounded by sun rays, and sometimes holding the infant Christ um, against, uh, say, the, the background could be white circular, uh, framed in gold, right, that would be. Uh, typical. The Madonna portrait, by the way, was universally adopted by the colors of the senior uh, company, right, the regiment, but other live fan and could include other uh, symbols such as the, the solar one, right, so much so that they were known through their colors, in fact, as the sun colors. And there, of course, was a lot, you know, royal uh, meaning, uh, as I explained in that video about the Sol Invictus for the broader tradition of you know, sacred monarchy. Um, on some cavalry flags of 1631, you could even um, see uh, the papal crown uh, and uh, with the right talons, the scepter in his left, and a uh, typical motto could be pro ecclesia et pro imperia, right? So for the church, for the empire, right? So the fully traditional uh, universal imperial ideology. The heavy cavalry type of flag used um, sort of square, right? Light cavalry had uh, one with usually two rounded points as well. Uh, you could find, again, monograms to talk about. Thirty Years' War of the Emperors by Ferdinand II, Ferdinand III, again, Vir the Virgin Mary, in the colonel's flags. This naturally was imitated by some allies, right, some Catholic allies of, say, the, 
the Habsburgs uh, within Germany proper, but still it was part of the empire, so they mixed, as we'll see now, with, everything was extremely mixed in composition, but um, it's obvious that the gluing symbols and beliefs were about the Catholic uh, confession. Um, speaking on the uh, Landsknechts that, again, we um, discussed elsewhere more in depth, um, they did carry themselves the uh, double eagle ensign on uh, black and uh, gold slash um, yellow. There were also among them naturally other brightly colored flags with other geometrical patterns, etc. Speaking of the standards size, on average, they um, they were around six foot, like something like 180 centimeters square. They were used on short steps. Their bearers were, again, to defend them with their life. There are so many um, episodes of very, very con uh, connected with this from the Middle Ages in general. Uh, the standard bearer was meant to die just with, with a flag uh, pretty much all over Europe and there are beautiful passages about um, the, 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 the German troops uh, even described by anti-German historians such as um, Jovius right, telling the story of a Langsnack that basically had his uh, the, bearing the ensign the, the flag, holding the flag, um, having his hand cut off and the other smashed, right, so that he defended uh, the uh, the colors by holding the flag in his teeth, right. Uh, we we know historically again of people that died literally with the with the flag still in their hands, not leaving them. So here we go beyond uh, what we mostly think about the the, the psychophysical limits of contemporary uh, reality, but they lived and died because of these values uh, specifically. The most interesting thing I would say is that when the Landsknechts um, were used as mercenaries as well serving foreign powers, they would bear their own flags, right? Um, for example, the famous Black Band that fought also at Pavia, etc., um, and serving the French, um, had um, the cross white uh, with background black and red or blue uh, likely we do not have at least the complete um, uh, certainty but surely that there was a lot of complexity attached to the symbols and again we are not incredibly satisfactorily documented about uh, the details right but we know they were there and that you know such colors really started defining something again in the mo in modern warfare some sort of professional troops that were also updated from say the companies of medieval times to something larger and more professional and that began to identify with, with the colors of course that had a history etc in a more say uh, regimental direction um, so as you understand from the complicacies of the say of the German estates when we look at the bat uh, the, the battles of the Thirty Years War we can imagine there being uh, an incredibly complex uh, array uh, to say the least of troops from different uh, states right who thus were not you know uniform uh, and uh, as far as, as we've seen the clothes, we've already seen that, they, that at best they had some sort of distinguishing badge for understanding which side they were, uh, aside from the, the single unit's identification uh, means. Um, they also spoke different languages, as a matter of fact. Germany is big, it's um, quite say, different from extreme to extreme um, and flags consequently would mirror this but also be the privileged tools to 
increase uh, each side's cohesion. Right? Today we talk about the Catholics, but generally speaking, this is true for the Protestants as well. From not talking about the fact that uh, see, not just the Germans, but uh, the foreigners. Uh, the flag is, of course, a rallying point. It is uh, one of the single most uh, fundamental device for uh, maintaining unit cohesion orientation, uh, in fact, uh, recognition. And sometimes, in fact, being the only way of telling who those guys were, even between friend and foe. There were also many flags on, on the battlefield, exactly because of the non-sort of homogenized um, type of troops that were fielded. Each company essentially would have its own, and that was the most important overall, because you could have the regimental one out there, or what essentially would become that historically, but still having different companies scattered here and there, not really realizing what, what, what was going on. Um, because they tended to, of course, homogenize the same company's colors, right, within uh, the larger units, but that was somehow more complicated for, especially for the Catholics that had also less, we say, were less um, overall equipped than, than the Swedes. They, they weren't so, um, let's say, units really, as we've seen from a political point of view, um, like uh, like a monarchy that, was there being paid by France, right? So with massive support. So this changed really a lot. It makes you understand also why such countries carried out such uh, innovations first rather than others. But the ways were fundamentally similar. Imperial fl uh, infantry flags came again uh, in this variety of size and color. Their symbols and mottos, however, being quite eloquent about the allegiance to the imperial house and the Catholic cause, without mentioning that on, on the Doppel Adler breast was represented the Habsburgic coat of arms, but also the Burgundian saltire, uh, the emperor's cipher, as we've seen, uh, sometimes just alone or in combination, right? This really depended uh, on the um, on, on the flag um, and the black doppel adler had been there as more generically the heraldic symbol of the Holy Roman Empire since the 15th century right and the eagle just uh, say the normal one in the previous ones obviously since ever the Roman times pre like the, the eagle as a universal symbol of Indo-European dominance uh, etc and at this point it had been more, say, loaded in, in other symbols. For example, the imperial crown with gold halos around the head, uh, holding a, an orb, a scepter, and a sword of state. Right, And this were, of course, the, the prerogatives of the imperial um, uh, authority that were kept in the bird's gold talons. Uh, at the beginning, the Doppel Adler displayed a holy cross, by the way, in its center. Also the imperial cipher, or the current ruler. By the 30s of the 17th century, it had a breast shield instead, bearing the coat of arms of Austria specifically. Um, so the horizontal silver bar on a field of red, as you've seen also in the video I made about the duchy, at this point arch duchy of, um, of Austria. And sometimes the Austrian coat of arms could be surrounded also by the chain of the order of the Golden Fleece that the Habsburgs also in Austria were, um, say, uh, remembering in a heartfelt way as a, as a Burgundian legacy back back in the day, in the 15th century, even before, um, well, still from their Burgundian ancestry, but, I mean, before the marriage between the Valois Burgundy and the Habsburgs. So by the end of the Thirty Years' War, there were some um, colors 
bringing just the Imperial Cipher, Ferdinand and the second F um, double I, or for Ferdinand and the third F triple I, right? Um, sometimes below the Imperial Crown, as to say, that's the guy who is currently wearing it, right? Um, these flags were materially made of silk, while uh, the central emblems were stitched on, right? Sometimes they were even painted, but it, it's relatively rare. As we've seen, uh, the sizes were <clears throat> around, um, you know, smaller, uh, let's say, 180 centimeters, right? They were from the smaller end, right? But they could vary, really, something like um, 110 per 150 to 350 to 420, something like that. And this tells you, of course, also the, the variety that depended on, of course, the size of the units and or the general circumstances, whether they could afford that, whether, I don't know, some, some general was more um, attentive to that and or it was a bigger deal, um, etc., there was also really no regulation at this time for the edging of the flags, unlike in other countries. Um, so Germany is a bit more traditional. There was um, usually a variation on simple flame-shaped triangles in, in the main colors, but some flags also had really different other uh, symbols, such as hearts, squares, diamonds, in some cases the, you know, the edge was checkered, right? Uh, and these symbols, at least the, the simpler ones, were rather standardized, right? Uh, they obviously were easier to represent, there was a general, you know, they, they had to make it easier to identify, right? Especially in the larger units, that, that's always the case, um, unless we're talking about the coats of arms, something more strictly identificative. But um, as far as the tactical function of the, of the sort of the companies, um, there was a fair uh, standardization. The background color was to change. Um, this was left to the aforementioned regimental Inaba, who usually, as we've seen, had a substantial. Uh, autonomy. We have, and they would provide with, with, with the main tinctures at least for the same flag. We see blue, green, interestingly enough, albeit still the imperial colors of red or gold were pretty much out there. Um, the regiment company flags normally carried at least part of the same regimental emblem is something we have seen also in other armies uh, say of of the English Civil War for example this standard device and then the numerals right but that was at least the case in England I don't think there is here uh, any of that um, you could find then of course the Naba's coat of arms which as we've seen was kind of obvious considering that the guy wanted to attach his own brand to the um, uh, troops they had levied. The backgrounds could vary um, in this case as well. You could find red, white, green, yellow, etc. And there were all this kind of different symbols um, really uh, connected with the broader military life in a sense. Fortuna, Virtus, uh, Vigilancia, Bellum, Pax, Vita, Mors, right? You could have still some sort of animals, right, in, in the guise of some heraldic concept. Saints, obviously, um, for the Catholic side, um, in abundance. The troops of Wallenstein had the um, image of Mars and Venus carried on flags, and this is, um, you know, a complementary connection may have also to do with the fact that Caesar descended from both deities, so sense is that the Catholic cause uh, was that sort of traditional in remembrance, you know, that Wallenstein was raised a Protestant, but 
he had signed he had broken free from that right and firmly um in fact reinstated his catholicism uh and again the the idea of the empire the caesars etc was pretty much alive because that's what the catholic um concept of empire means also dating back to pagan times the marksman that did exist as we were saying before had saint sebastian on their flags for obvious reasons given that the saint had been had been shot at an enormous amount of arrows uh, uh, geographically um the sappers colors instead often displayed saint joseph right as a woodworker fundamentally um and this really pertained to just an older tradition this is not just relevant to the 30 years war it was there were just older symbologies um the imperial contingents supplied by in fact imperial princes you all used similar designs they tended again to be um imitating each other uh with the state color as the background you have the doppel adla on the obverse the princes are on the reverse and they would have say the the state colors uh in the in the edge right for example for i don't know bavaria blue and white right the mottos are quite interesting they were usually in latin because that was of, of course the official language of the empire uh of the papacy but naturally it would be present in german as much as in italian and even french right uh these were of course the the dominant uh language uh just in europe at the time and they expressed a um, pretty interesting set of concepts they um were apparently more common for cavalry standards than infantry uh this is uh interesting because it somehow expresses some sort of greater specificity and or pride and you know sense of customization Uh, among the more active and somehow more aristocratic cavalry some of the most famous ones were sic transit gloria mundi um deo duce so god is our leader god is leading us essentially auspices fortuna so um with this you know protector comes good fortune in oxenia vinces so the constantinian motto even that that's how traditional it, it went um there was uh, also the holy cross often um displayed um you have pro imperatore meusque vitam et sanguine right so i give essentially my life and blood for the emperor right then in german ohne ru ist mein glück that is to say uh, and not only who is mein glück but friede mein unglück that is to say because uh, who means quietness etc but here um so uh, unru essentially would be the opposite um and unru here stands for chaos rather and this is fascinating because in tradition right the idea is that um if chaos is your happiness that's the place where you must be as a soldier right because of individual transfiguration in holy combat so like vivere militare est right peace is a misfortune as a matter of fact and war is the moment of great or uh, exaltation and uh, proof of 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 divine blessing for the the ultimate sacrifice uh, um the jesuit order found it, it its way uh, through symbology right in the armies of the catholic counter reformation throughout these two centuries um and it uh, did appear on the the army's colors in fact um one could be the anagram ihs which stands for yesum abemus socium which means we have jesus as an ally right plus um field ensigns um tended to reduce the 
the, the confusion right in general this signs were comforting they were well visible they they were really uh serving that life and soul saving function say even for those who were passing uh, under them uh so you you may want to appreciate this specific aspect um there were field badges the feldzeichen that were um as we've seen essentially the the alternative to uniforms right uh um, among the most common you could find a hat plume leg or shoe ribbon hatband scapes as we've seen for the aristocrats sashes was the, the bigger deal was the greater prerogative um and you couldn't quite like you could use any color at that point because it was just maybe for the single battle like it was not really um universal always present at least every unit would find even on camping their own ways to identify themselves uh, also through i don't know passwords uh, you know other other knowledge at uh, the aforementioned battle of the white mountain for example the imperials and the bavarians used white symbols especially with sashes and scarves and this again could even be the case for just the, the commanders but not only um but again it's not that everybody had to literally have the stuff before battle i mean it would have taken forever just even to organize that right um in any case the winter king um the bohemian side wore sky blue during the 1631 campaign the soldiers of the catholic league wore a white stripe a ribbon around the arm uh they could also use green oak leaves or hanks of straw so that something really that it could find pretty much everywhere um and so you understand how the symbols were uh, often much less sophisticated than actual pieces of cloth or the same color etc makes a lot of sense um wallenstein as we've seen ordered the use of red symbols in his army we are around 1632 neck scarves sashes um the all the other colors he actually prohibited on pain of death right so that um these symbols as simple as they were they were not just uh you know necessary for a matter of recognition right that could that if you wouldn't use could cause all problems because think about all the friction deriving from soldiers not recognizing themselves immediately and so on but it was also a way to to identify really more in the cause if you think about that it was feeling the safety um even devil thing um esprit de corps through that right having this and mechanical ways it could even be used by the enemy not naturally if um discovered uh, in some missions especially incursions etc to uh to somehow r- play that risky card right again passwords uh, th- there was the feldwort um there were also specific battle cries uh the wallenstein uh troops usually uh, of course chose uh, the catholic slogans that were jesus maria um other uh say but you understand the general tone here so this is more or less the the picture you can argue that there was plenty of different uh shades of this there are surely also more uh information that we can derive from that i make this type of videos cuz it's not that i find them particularly more interesting than the others the only truth but i think they help uh sort of providing uh a picture about things that you wouldn't normally in fact think of and that however and true which let's say we can really understand other aspects right of tactics 
of just of culture of identity etc and so i think that there is really a lot of of interest stuff of interesting stuff to to derive from this uh this interesting this details right um so for today we are however stopping here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content for today i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye